All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Hi everybody, my name is Stephen Markle. I'm the Product and Applications Manager for Milestone Incorporated here in North America. Today, we're gonna to talk about the DMA-80 EVO Direct Mercury Analyzer, specifically for your academic needs. A little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. I'm coming to you from Zoom. I'm on the Milestone Lab guest cart. If you go up to that top tab there and click view, hit side-by-side -side speaker, it's gonna change the aspect ratio between the presentation and also the overhead camera. I'll go back and forth between the two. And then I'll be on the lab cart on the side. If you guys wanna change the ratio between those two screens, you just click that uh, little double line there and drag it whichever direction you want. You can make it 70, 30, 50, 50, whatever you see fit. Um, I'll be going back and forth two or three times throughout the presentation. So just be ready to move it uh, depending on what you need to see. There's also a Q&A button on the bottom. Click that, type in a question. It'll pop up for me and I will get all of, all of those answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, feel free if they come you know, top of mind as I'm going through it. Don't need to wait to the end. Just throw them up there. It's not gonna interrupt me or anything. Uh, and we'll get to them at the, uh, the end of the presentation. So I wanted to do this a little bit differently than a standard virtual demo or equipment demonstration and uh, make it a little bit more real world. So I wanted to actually do a little Mercury experiment while, you, while we're going over the instrument and what it can do. So I did, uh, this is my, my personal property here in uh, Connecticut, we're in Fairfield County, and I have a two acre parcel. So what I did was I went through and I selected different soil samples on my, on my piece of land to test the Mercury. And I'll run those. And then as they're running, I'll go over the presentation by the time we're done in about 20 minutes. We'll have our three results and we'll be able to sort of map out some mercury contamination on my, on my uh, piece of land there. Uh, I don't think there is any contamination, but it was a, a little fun experiment for me. So uh, on here, I have three different samples. Sample one is a septic leach field. And for those of you who don't have a septic system, just a little bit of background, they're new to me. Uh, I hadn't had one until we moved up to uh, Connecticut, but essentially every drain, bathtub, kitchen faucet, any water that comes into my home comes out through a septic system. It's then uh, neutralized through a, a, a synergistic bacteria, but the overflow goes out of the tank into what's called a leaching field. There's a picture there. That's not my, my yard. That is uh, somebody else's yard. God willing, they never have to dig mine up and they stay safe, uh, safe the entire time. But all that water running off goes through these pipes and they're distributed out under, underground. And then uh, they, they come up as you know the grass grows and everything like that. So I figured my house was built in 93 that, uh, you know, 30-ish years of water flowing through these leaching fields would at some point have some mercury come through it, whether it be from food waste or um, dirty drinking water, whatever it is. Again, don't expect to see contamination, but it's, uh, I figured that'd be where some of the higher load would be. Sample two there, the, uh, the purple spot on the top is a protected wetlands, and that runs off, you can't really see it on the diagram, but it runs off into a small creek that goes sort of through my backyard. So sample two is sediment from under that creek bed where the water runs over. I don't know exactly where all the wetlands water comes from. It's up higher in the, uh, in the hills, but I figured over the course of however long those wetlands have existed, the water running through that creek could deposit some mercury contamination. And then as somewhat of a control, I took sample three, which is ledge. It's like a rock face that we have here in Connecticut. Um, so not a whole lot of soil around it, but it's also the high point on my yard. So any water that's uh, raining or coming through wouldn't really have time to settle. It would all run off. So I figured that'd be the cleanest area to go from. So I'm gonna pivot over to my document camera now and show you guys how to run the samples. We'll start them and then we'll pivot back to the presentation and go over a little bit about Milestone as well as the system itself. And we'll take a second to kick over. There we go. So this is our software terminal. When you actually open the system, it's gonna start on the system tab. You look down here, they're essentially columns, and this mirrors exactly how the inside of the system looks. So we have our auto sampler arm, which we can manually control through these valves here. We have our combustion furnace, which starts off at roughly room temperature. There's some heat coming off from the catalyst furnace, but starts off cold. And during our method, we'll heat up to 650 degrees Celsius to ash and volatilize off all our mercury. The catalyst furnace here is always at 565. That's this portion of the catalyst. That's gonna convert all of our mercury into its elemental form. This is our amalgamator here, the coil, electric coil wrapped around a gold amalgamator. So the mercury is gonna amalgamate there. It'll then heat up again to 850 degrees Celsius, volatilize off that mercury into our cuvette, our AA detector. This is always kept at 125 degrees Celsius to stop any moisture condensation if you're running aqueous-based samples. And these are the three voltages on my system. 
to run the, the system, it's like a book, you start from left to right. So we're gonna check our method, make sure we have the right one. This is our standard M80 method. It's what's referenced in EPA method 7473, direct combustion and amalgamation of mercury. It's a 30 second ramp to 200 to drive off any moisture and light volatiles, a 30 second hold to maintain that, uh, that volatization, a quick one minute ramp to 650 to start driving off our mercury and a one minute hold at 650. This is where all our mercury is gonna come out. Our calibration tab, I have a tri-cell. I'll go into the configurations much more in depth during the presentation, but I have three different cells to measure, my low, my mid, and my high. Each cell has its own calibration point, and you can see the R squared is here. So we've got three good curves, we're ready to run. If I go to my measure tab, I have some sub tabs down here. I'll check my links. I wanna make sure I have my most recent calibration as well as the correct method loaded in. I'll go to my results. And this is generally how I like to run my system and how most labs run their system. Obviously there's some internal quality controls that you have to, uh, to go through depending on your industry. But I start my day off by running a blank and I check my mercury height to make sure I have a clean system. And in this case, I have a very clean system. I go through and in, in this scenario, I ran a tort three. It's a certified reference material. It's a lobster hepatopancreas. And uh, I ran that, I put in uh, 64 milligrams. I got uh, a height of 18 nanograms and a concentration of 285.9 ppb. Sorry, that's in ppm, but I can just as easily come down and change that to ppb. And that's right within the range of that certified reference material. So I've checked my calibration. I know that they're good and ready to go. I've already preloaded in my first two samples. This is the ledge sample, be number three on the, uh, the diagram that I showed you guys. Weighed out 230 milligrams. I did the creek, weighed out at 152 milligrams. And now I'm going to add on my septic leaching field soil. That's what it looks like right there. It's nothing too special, it's pretty dark. To add a sample, I'm gonna hit this plus button here. Double click, I'm just gonna call it leaching. And you can see I have my DMA integrated with the scale. It's at zero right now. So that's without a boat. I'm gonna place a quartz sample boat onto the scale. Tear it out again. And then at this point, I'm just gonna weigh about 100 milligrams of my sample. I've got a, a Q and A here that's saying uh, that they're not hearing me, but it's just one individual. Can somebody else check in and, and let me know if I'm being heard or not? And just type it on the QA, you know, I can hear you or I can't. I'm gonna assume that, uh, okay, so somebody else came on and said that they can hear me. Um, the individual who can't, I, I apologize, I don't know what the technical difficulties could be, but if you could check your speakers. Um, yeah, everybody else is confirming that, that, that they're hearing me okay, so uh, apolog oops, apologies, I can't be more help um, on the technical aspects of this one. So I'll go ahead and continue again, sorry that, uh, sorry that you're having technical difficulties. So I'm gonna go in and weigh out, again, about 100 milligrams. And it doesn't have to be exact. The soil's a little, a little moist. I didn't dry these, they're just as is um, analysis. Obviously I'm not doing any real research project on the uh, mercury levels in my uh, backyard soil. So not super important, just more of a proof of concept to show you guys how easy it is to go through and run your DMA. I've got 186 milligrams there, I'm gonna close the door. And now all I have to do is click that scale button and it ports it directly into my sample table. Integrating your scales an option, you can easily double click these and manually enter your weights. However, it's a, uh, a little bit more cumbers cumbersome and can lead to some transcription errors. So, oh, I've also selected carousel position three on my 40 position auto sampler for this sample in particular. So let me zoom in for you guys on your auto sampler there. That's my first soil, my second soil, and now I'm gonna take my small quartz boat with my soil inside of it, place it on position three, and now I'm ready to run my sample. So at this point, I'm gonna press play. The auto sampler is gonna move over. It's gonna lift the sample one with an elevator here. This arm will come back and push it into my 
combustion furnace, and the run will begin. You'll also see this light is going to go from white, which means it's on standby, and it'll turn red, meaning that it's running. When the batch is finished, it's going to turn green. So we'll press play. Turns red. See our sample arm retract here. A little elevator lifts up that boat, and then just gently sets it on the fork, which puts it into the catalyst, and our run has begun. If I go back to my system tab here, I can see my set points change to 650. It's going to ramp up to that and then cool back off to 250 degrees Celsius before it injects the second boat. There's also a fun little load bar down here that shows you real time where the sample is. So red, it's drying and ashing. The gray P is a purge where the mercury is amalgamated to the gold, but carrier gas is still pushing through all your matrix interferences, allowing for a very clean signal and low detection levels. After that purge, the purple H is our amalgamator heating up to 850, revolatizes that mercury, which then passes through our AA detector and gets read out in a spectrograph real time. So those are running, bought myself about 20 minutes to talk to you guys, and then we'll visit the, uh, the results towards the end. Kick back over to the presentation. There we go. And uh, I'll go a little bit about Milestone, and then we'll jump into the system and its, its technical aspects. Milestone was established in 1988. We have over 30 years of experience in the microwave technology and direct mercury analysis space. We have over 20,000 microwave systems worldwide and over 3,000 DMAs globally installed across all segments and industries, academia like yourself, government agencies, Fortune 500, manufacturing, environmental contract, cannabis contract. If you can think of a segment or industry, we most likely have a system in place there. We are a global company. Our headquarters is in Bergamo, Italy. It's about an hour north of Milan. I'm coming to you from our North American headquarters in Shelton, Connecticut, about an hour outside of New York City. The systems are R&D and manufactured in Germany and Switzerland. They then go to our Bergamo location. Italy QCs them there. And then the ones destined for North America come to Shelton. We QC them again and ship them out to you guys. Excuse me. So while we, are, uh, while we work closely with our Italian colleagues, we do consider ourselves a fully autonomous facility. We have our own applications, our own service, our own parts warehouse, um, our own sales team. So uh, you won't run into the issue of if you need a new catalyst for your DMA, you got to wait for it to come from Italy. We have it all here in-house in Shelton, Connecticut, and can get it to you guys. Uh, very quickly. Brief overview of other technologies that we have and offer, and then we'll jump into the DMA. Backbone of our, of our company is microwave digestion, uh, acid digestion in preparation for elemental analysis in an ICP or ICP MS. We have a rotor-based system there, our ethos up, um, different rotor configurations and segments depending on your sample matrix and your throughput needs. The uh, is really a, a workhorse of, of any laboratory. The one next to it is our ultrawave system. That's a single reaction chamber. So highest temperature and pressure capabilities in, uh, in, in the field. Gets up to 280 degrees Celsius and 199 bar of pressure. Uh, very big in precious metals, catalyst, geochemical, those really tough to digest samples. The ultrawave can generally take care of it. The top middle part there is our clean chemistry line. We have an acid purification system. That's a small benchtop model. It uses subboiling acid, subboiling uh, distillation to purify reagent grade nitric acid or HCl into trace or ultra trace grade. So if you guys are going through a lot of trace grade acids, you can purchase a $50 bottle of reagent acid and purify it in-house to a thousand plus dollar bottle of uh, ultra trace grade. The one on the far right there is our trace clean system, uh, acid steam cleaning with nitric acid used to uh, get down to trace levels on your ICPMS components, um, Teflon consumables, quartz, glass, really anything that's acid resistant, that system can clean it. Predominantly designed to clean digestion vessels for rotor-based and single reaction chamber systems, but can be used for numerous applications of cleaning. Microwave extraction, um, you guys are probably all more or less involved in some environmental aspects uh, since you're here for, for DMA. A lot of mercury in, in academia is environmental-based. So on this one for microwave extraction, we have a system that's the uh, same body as our ethos up digestion platform, but the rotor is different allows you to do PC, uh, solvent extraction for PCBs, chlorinated pesticides, PAHs, dioxin serins, things like that with disposable glass liner. So you throw them away when you're done and basically replaces socket systems under EPA method 3546. Uh, can do 24 samples in about 40 minutes, whereas a socket, each individual one is a batch and it takes eight to 16 hours, depending on what you're extracting. Down there, we have microwave ashing through our pyro system. I actually have the demo unit right next to me here. Replaces traditional muffle furnaces. Instead of using uh, induction as a heat source, it uses microwave energy on a silicone carbide plate. Uh, allows you to fully program your temperatures, get fully ash samples, much more energy efficient, and generally shaves ashing time down from four hours to an hour. Microwave synthesis is on the side there. Uh, obviously, making novel compounds or synthesizing um, um, excipients, things like that. So uh, big in academia, we have several packages that work well for academic labs where students can run through numerous samples during a, you know, say a, a chemistry lab session. 
and uh, get some results the same, or be able to run it uh, on their machinery the same day. And that's the sample actually kicking over. We just finished our first run there. So now it's gonna cool off and then it's gonna inject our second sample. The DMA-80 was first released in 2001 in the US. We have, again, over 3,000 units worldwide, and it is specifically referenced in EPA method 7473, direct combustion and amalgamation of mercury. The system I have behind me is my, our seventh generation platform, came out around 2019, and uh, I have a tri-cell. Again, I'll get into configurations later, so I have the lowest detection range possible on this product line. Why do people love it? It's very simple. You just saw there's really no sample prep. I weighed out the soil in a boat, placed the boat in the system, pressed go. So it gives you very high throughputs and a lot less labor cost than traditional methods such as a cold vapor um, AA. And you can see there uh, to run a cold vapor, the majority of the, the prep time is spent in sample preparation, namely digestion. In the DMA, you spend a negligible amount in sample preparation and more time actually doing the analysis. The simplicity also leads to high productivity. We get results in less than six minutes per sample. And with a 40 position auto sampler, you can keep the thing cranking the entire day. With that level of speed, you're able to do in, in a chemistry lab setting, you can have your students each run their own sample, collect their own data and generate a lab report real time. So very fast. And again, there's a productivity comparison between cold vapor and the DMA. Uh, and an eight, that's for an eight hour shift. You'll generally get say uh, 50 samples on a cold vapor you'll get 80 plus in a DMA if you're efficient. It's a very convenient system. Today we're doing solids and soil, but uh, you can easily do liquids, you can do gas samples, and all of that can be done under the same calibration curve and the same methodology. You don't have to change anything over. I can go from solid to liquid to gas, back to solid, all in the same day, on the same run if I want to. And again, we're not doing any acid digestion, so we have no wet chemistry, less labor, less cost, as well as no hazardous waste disposal to worry about. The system's very reliable. It's got a high sensitivity range or high uh, flexible sensitivity range, high accuracy and precision. Again, I'll go over the configurations in a couple of slides, but the throughput robustness and ease of use allows for high impact studies on mercury to be done in your guys's realm. And I'll touch on a couple of those throughout the slide. Publish or perish, that's the, that's the world you guys live in. So if you just do a quick Google on DMA 80 mercury peer review or you know, whatever keywords you wanna use, you're going to find numerous studies that cite the DMA as the tool of choice for their mercury analysis. And just to spike one out, that last one that popped up is uh, one that's kind of close to our hearts here at, uh, at HQ. This is a really cool project, and we have a great relationship with that group. They're tracking artisanal gold mining in the Peruvian rainforest. So this is Professor Luis Fernandez at Wake Forest University, and they're down there in Peru mapping out and remediating all of the destruction that's being caused by illegal gold mining. They work in remote field-based labs. They have DMAs in place on benches, but they also are not scared to put them onto carts, hook them up to a diesel generator and take them out into the field. And they'll run mercury samples real time as they're maneuvering through the rainforest. Why is the rainforest getting devastated? Because artisanal miners ball up mercury like you see on the picture there on the uh, left side. They ball it up in their bare hands, they throw it into water, they throw it in the soil, and it amalgamates the gold from whatever source they're throwing it into so they can collect it and that's how they make their living. So it's an unfortunate way, but um, you know, just to put it in perspective, they really do handle it with their bare hands. I'll, the next slide will show how they actually extract the mercury out and it'll paint a, a broader picture for you. The average life expectancy in that region is 37 because of stuff like this. So after they've amalgamated the gold to the mercury, they throw it in a, uh, like a Bunsen burner or a hot system like that. They vaporize off the mercury and they collect their gold and then they sell it. As they're vaporizing off this mercury, it's collected in rainwater, it's collected in droplets on leaves, it's collected in the soil, it's everywhere. Um, and it's a very sticky, long lasting element. So it's, it's just eviscerating the rainforest, contaminating wildlife and uh, wreaking a ton of havoc in that area. So the DMA is helping them, um, it's a tool for them, right? I don't wanna take credit for what they're doing. They're doing great work down there, but it's helping them uh, analyze these samples quickly, efficiently, and the robust design allows it to exist in that rainforest type environment in open air and uh, they, they don't really have any issues with it. So there's some of the devastation that you can see that all used to be trees, and now it is just absolutely eviscerated because of this mining uh, operation. So it's a really cool academic project. Um, it's just one that I wanted to spike out because it, it kind of speaks to the robustness of the system and how you can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's plenty of universities that trust us. Um, we are the market leader in academic mercury analysis. These are just a few of our clients, and. Um, Wake Forest was the one that I spiked out there on the bottom, but they're all doing great research using the system or teaching their students how to use the system and more about mercury analysis. 
So principles of operation, I covered it a little bit, but this is sort of a video of the internal system here. And just so you guys know what it looks like inside. This is our catalyst tube here. I'm gonna go the other way so it makes more sense. This is our catalyst tube here. This is our combustion furnace. This is a quartz boat. The fork, it stays on the fork, the sampling fork the entire time and just sits inside that furnace as it's getting um, heated up. So what that looks like in real life is it's gonna throw that boat in there. Again, ramp up to 200 degrees Celsius to drive off any moisture and light volatiles and quickly jump to 650 to drive off your mercury. Mercury is gonna pass through the catalyst, which is gonna convert it to its elemental form, which then gets amalgamated to the gold amalgamator there. Sits there for about 30 seconds while the carrier gas, either oxygen or compressed air, is pushing through any matrix interferences without being detected. After that 30 seconds, there's a coil around the amalgamator that heats up to 850, revolatizes off that mercury, which passes through the detector interference free. All that happens in about five minutes. So just touching on the instrument features, it is as simple as weigh the sample, load the sample boat and press start. That single decomposition method works for most samples. We say most because on some precious metals and geochemicals, some really tough, dense stuff, you do go a little bit hotter for academic purposes and for what I'm doing today specifically, 650 is more than enough. Uh, no sample prep other than weighing out the sample, very easy to use and again, I touched on it. You can use industrial grade oxygen or compressed air as a carrier gas. We do sell a compressor with the system as optional. That will keep a nice dry airflow into the, uh, into the catalyst furnace. I have mine in an oxygen tank right now because I've loaned out my compressor to a client who needed it. But uh, either, and you can also run it on a zero air compressed gas. If you have house air, you can run it uh, on house air as well, as long as it's dry. You only need about 70 PSI to run the system and it only goes through about seven liters an hour. It does not consume a ton of gas. Minimal maintenance, I'll touch on it at the end what some of the maintenance is, um, but really it's just making sure your catalyst and your amalgamator are, um, uh, are not consumed. They are the only consumables on the instrument. Generally, you have to replace them every year, depending on sample load. Again, we can analyze all matrices with no matrix effects due to that thermal decomposition process. We use one calibration for all of our matrices. If I was to go to gas after this, I would still use that same calibration curve. Great thing about the system is it's not like an ICPMS where you have to calibrate it daily. The calibration generally lasts about a year. If you're using some more um, aggressive samples, maybe acids or caustics, uh, you might need to replace it every six to eight months. But for general use, uh, the majority of our clients, it'll last a year plus. Again, we're not generating any acid waste because we're not doing any wet chemistry. And all the mercury that we volatize off these samples has to go somewhere, right? So it actually exits the cuvette from the back of the system, comes along a hose and goes through this activated charcoal trap here. There's always carrier gas flowing out of the end, but all our mercury is on this trap. What that allows me to do is run it in an open air demo lab, a classroom, a conference room, um, a hotel room, right? I've ran these systems everywhere. I don't have any fume hood or ventilation requirements because of this setup here. So it's safe to operate pretty much anywhere. And we are moving on to our third sample in a second. Three different system configurations. Again, I have a tri cell behind me. It'll get down to about 100 PPT. Uh, we like to say less than one PPB, but if you keep a nice clean system and you're always operating in that trace realm, it'll, it'll stay at 100 PPT comfortably. The dual, and it'll go up to 10 ppm. Sorry. The dual cell system is obviously, you see the nomenclature here is one less cell than the tri cell. So we don't go down to that super low trace levels. We go to about 10 ppb and again up to 10 ppm. About 80% of our install base is a dual cell. Not everybody needs to go that low, especially for academia, they tend to live with the dual cell as well. The wide range is uh, one ppm to 300 ppm. Really kind of specific for recycling operations, mining, cement, coal. Some of the guys who just know they have higher load mercury samples just by the nature of the work they do, they go with the wide range. But again, for, your, for, for most of your guys' work, dual cell will work. Uh, some academia go with a tri cell. There were quite a few upgrades from the sixth generation to the seventh generation behind me, but I wanted to spike out this, the major one here. The seventh generation, they added a double beam spectrophotometer. So we have one beam that measures our mercury concentration. We have another beam that measures the noise inside the detector then mathematically cancels that out inside the system. What that does is enhance our signal to noise ratio, giving us better reproducibility and lower detection limits. As an example there, that is a 30 PPT sample. The left side spectrograph is on our sixth generation and the right side is on our seventh generation. So you can see just from the reduction of that noise, 
we get a much crisper peak, we get nice symmetry, and we get a very flat, clean baseline. So really enhance our reproducibility with that addition there. There's some additional hardware features. I've touched on the light a bit, still red because we're running samples. When it's done, it's gonna flash green. Uh, when you start the system up in the beginning of the day, it'll take about 20 minutes to reach its equilibration temperatures, mainly for that catalyst furnace to get to 565 Celsius. As it's reaching those temperatures, it's not usable. You can actually program a batch and start it. It just won't start it till it reaches the temperatures. This light's yellow, meaning that it's heating up. Goes to white on standby when it's not being used for about five minutes. Red when we're running a batch, green when the batch is done. Also, if let's say my oxygen tank runs out, um, I have a power surge, something goes wrong with the system, this light will actually flash red if there's an error. So if a technician's working in the lab, they can quickly glance over, make sure the system's still running, make sure everything's going well, or see if the batch is done and they can start adding more samples. The furnace, like we touched on, really only needs to get to 650 for your methodology, but it can get up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. So let's say you're doing a, uh, a fish tissue sample and that uh, piece of fish muscle explodes in the furnace, kind of creates a, a gunky mess, it happens on occasion. Instead of just trying to run multiple batches at 650 to ash out that sample, you can run a cleaning run, close up the system, heat everything up to 1,000 degrees, and really bake out the entire cavity to get it nice and clean for the next run. Rarely happens, but just an example of why you might need to use 1,000 degrees Celsius. And uh, the system can integrate with a balance. You guys saw how easy that was. Um, it's mainly just an Ethernet cord on the back of the terminal here. Connected to a balance, eliminates transcription errors. We actually had a client that has three DMAs and they got dinged by their regulatory agency. They had a, a transcription error that cascaded down pretty far um, through their product line and uh, the regulator caught it, which is great. And then they, they got their, you know, we'll call it a citation or a deficiency, whatever, whatever their industry uses for the term. Their corrective action was actually to just purchase three scales, one for each DMA and integrate them in. And that was good enough for the regulatory agency. So they did that the next day and we got them taken care of. They were up and running and everything was good but really does increase your workflow capabilities. Just weighing out a sample and hitting that button instead of typing it in is, a, is, is quite a game changer in a, in a high throughput lab or like an environmental contract lab. I've already kind of given you all a rundown of the software features, but I wanted to touch on a few of the, uh, the highlights here. One of the main ones is the auto blank feature. Mercury is a sticky element. If you have a high load sample, it can sort of contaminate the entire system and you have to do cleaning runs to get it out or you can program your auto blank. This is fully customizable to your data set and your operation. Just for, for, for round numbers here, um, let's say I set my threshold that if a mercury sample was over 100 nanograms of mercury, I want the system to auto blank down to 0.1 nanograms, right? And it'll run as many auto blanks as it needs to to get clean again, automatically, you don't have to do anything. So that first sample came up at 105 nanograms above my threshold, excuse me. The system's gonna initiate an auto blank, it'll run it, Let's say the second sample came up at five nanograms, I'm still over the 0.1 nanogram threshold that I would call a clean system in this scenario. So it would run a second auto blank, I have a nice clean baseline, and then the system would pick right back up where it left off in the batch. It does this all automatically, so if you're running samples overnight, it'll clean the system itself and continue the run. You won't come into an error and 30 unrun samples because your 10th sample was a high load mercury sample that you didn't know about. It also saves the auto blank feature. So if you come in the next morning and you look at you know, sample five had seven auto blanks after it, what's going on with that sample kind of gives you a, a key to, to some, some samples that might be an issue. So avoids carryover in the system, gives more reliable data and avoids you having to rerun and reprocess samples. The software is 21 CFR compliant. Uh, you can have an audit trail and a history and you can program different access levels. So you could have a professor access level where you guys can go in and manipulate data I shouldn't say manipulate data, that's the wrong term. Manipulate methodology, um, check data, check your calibration curves. You can do everything you need to in the system. And then you can have a separate login for a student where they can only say load a method and press play, right? Dumbs it down so they can't uh, mess up any of the work that you guys have done. System can export data in a CSV format or an Excel format, one or the other. It can't do both at the same time. So if you're integrating into a LIM system, a CSV would be the way to go there. If you just want a nice, easy, editable format, an Excel file works well too. And it can always transport a PDF file alongside either one of those CSV or Excel files. And then I wanted to touch on Milestone Connect. System's gonna come with a nice little welcome kit, your hard instruction manual. This is for a rotor-based system. A little welcome card explaining Milestone Connect. A login card specific to your instrument serial number a USB drive with all of your other files, uh, more instruction manuals, digital copies of everything. 
And then a complimentary iPad that comes preloaded with Milestone Connect. That's what the interface, I can't really see it too well. That's what the interface looks like. And what Milestone Connect is a, is a web-based platform that's essentially a repository of information. So it's got all of our app notes, our scientific papers, tips and techniques, spare parts and consumables for your specific instrument, um, tutorial videos, user manuals, really everything at the touch of your fingers. That's what the home page looks like there. And just to draw your attention to the support tab on the top middle, that's really the, the key to Milestone Connect is it's a direct interface to Milestone North America. So you drop down that support tab. Let's say you've just changed your catalyst and your amalgamator and you need to order some new ones because you should always have spares. You can drop that down, click the customer service tab and then say, I need a, to order a new catalyst and amalgamator for my DMA. They'll ship you, they'll send you over a quote um, and get the parts right out to you. Let's say you're running a new type of sample that you've never run before and there's not an app note on this for that sample. You can drop down that support tab, click applications and it'll port directly to my department and we'll help you walk through the application and troubleshoot the problem with you and help develop it with you. And then if you, whatever reason you show up on a Monday and the DMA doesn't turn on, you don't know why, drop down that support tab, hit service, and it'll port you directly to our service department. You write them an email saying my DMA serial number XYZ uh, is not turning on, I need a service call. And they'll call you, they'll troubleshoot it, and if needed, they'll send out a technician to fix it. Our run is almost done. Let's see, a couple more minutes. This is a, uh, a new one to Milestone that we've developed, that Italy developed, I should say. And uh, we've got methylmercury on seafood specifically that you can do on the DMA. They're working on it with other matrix types as well, but so far we're just on seafood. And I just wanted to give you as a quick rundown through that method. Our sample just finished up. Quick rundown through that method uh, because it's, it's quite, the sample prep takes a little bit of time, but running it on the DMA is the same exact thing that we just did with our soil. So it's very quick to get results. Sample prep just takes a little bit. Let's say you were doing a uh, fish tissue. You'd homogenize one gram of fish tissue into a 50 mil centrifuge tube. You'd add a 25% sodium chloride solution and shake for two minutes. You then add four mils of hydrochloric acid and 15 mils of toluene, shake for another two minutes. And then centrifuge for 20 minutes at 3000 G. That's gonna separate that toluene layer out. You then transfer the toluene layer by pipette to a new centrifuge tube, add five mils of an L15 solution. There's some other components in there too, which it's nothing difficult, you can make it in house. And then you shake for 10 minutes, either by hand or on a shaking mechanism. At that point, you have your cysteine layer on the bottom and your toluene layer on the top. The cysteine layer is where your methylmercury is, is residing. So you drop a pipette down in there, pull out 100 to 300 milligrams, weigh it out on a coarse boat, and then inject that boat into the system and it'll give you a methylmercury result. So it's a really exciting application for us. I think methylmercury is a very interesting uh, um, topic of discussion and I'm, I'm glad that the DMA can, can uh, fill, that, fill that void for, for seafood specifically for fish and fish-like products. So just wanted to put that guy on, on your radar because it's, uh, it's a unique application and, and gives some more, even more versatility to an already versatile instrument. And since our results are done, I'll bring back up my, my little parcel here just to remind everybody. We got leach fields, creek sediments, and ledge. And I'll port back over to our results so you guys can see what it looks like. So I'll go to my measure tab, I'm in PPB. I believe I got these samples mixed up. I think it's ledge and leaching. Leaching fields was 200 PPB. My creek sediment was 120 PPB. And my ledge, sorry for the mistake, is 40 PPB. So my theory kind of held true. My, uh, my creek sediment and my my leaching fields had the highest concentration of mercury, nothing to be alarmed about, right? My kids can still play in the backyard um, or in the front yard where the leaching fields are, not a huge deal. And my ledge sediment came up nice and low at 40 ppb. It is that simple. We just ran three samples. We did a little mini mercury study and uh, we got the results that I somewhat expected. So that's, that's exciting for me. And my, uh, I don't have mercury in my front and backyard, which is good. So guys, quick conclusion, you get reliable results, high sensitivity, ease of operation. It's very cost effective. You have no sample prep cost other than the labor to weigh it out. And again, we're doing no wet chemistry, so we don't have to worry about disposal. 
And also with the system, you get customer support, application knowledge from the Academic Mercury Leader, as well as Milestone Connect, you have a direct interface to me and my team, so we can walk you through any issues that you have with the system or any application development you need assistance with. And with that, I will take any questions that you all have. I appreciate the time, and thank you for joining us today. I have it on another monitor, so I'll be off a little bit. Let's see. All right. Uh, if you're running the system off oxygen, how long does a standard cylinder last? At eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, running at seven liters an hour, is there a flow rate? Uh, general oxygen cylinder, like the one I have here that you guys can't see, it's, it's about, you know, it's one of the tall ones up to here on me. That'll last about two months of operation. If your sample load is less and you're not running the system for eight hours a day, five days a week, you can, an oxygen tank can last many, many months. Uh, are there any other consumables besides the catalyst and the amalgamator? Not necessarily, no. It's um, the catalyst and the amalgamator are what we recommend you replace. And this is actually a, a very old catalyst that we just used as a demo. When you get them, they're fully black, like this segment here. These are your two main consumables. Again, about every 5,000 runs or every, um, every time you're, you know, every 5,000 runs or if you start to see a lot of variability on either your oxygen flow rate or your sample matrices, your calibration curve verifications, things like that. It won't happen overnight. You're gonna see a slow trend downward or upward depending on which direction your, your catalyst is degrading. And you'll know before there actually is a problem that one is coming up. So we, re we recommend every year or every 5,000 runs, there are plenty of clients who are low volume and they replace these every two years, right? They just wait until they go bad. Other than that, the coil that wraps around the amalgamator we don't consider it a consumable necessarily. They are replaced every um, preventative maintenance visit by our service technicians. But uh, we do recommend you have a spare on hand. And it's just a small coil with two screws. You guys can easily change it out. They very rarely burn out before the service visit, but on occasion they do, right? They're going from room temperature up to 850 degrees Celsius a ton of times a day, depending on how many samples you're running. So they, they will eventually burn out and um, they're very, very cheap. So it's easy to just have a couple on hand. Again, generally they, they are replaced before they burned out, but just, a, just a, a word of caution. Everything else on the system um, is, it would be a service visit. The transformer, um, your cuvette, things like that. Nothing that the, uh, you guys would have to worry about. That's the service thing. Really your only concern is the catalyst amalgamator and on occasion the amalgamator coil. Okay, so I got uh, one that asked if I can demonstrate how to do a new calibration on the DMA. Um, I've, it would take too long. To, it takes about an hour and a half, two hours to do a full calibration, um, a little bit longer on a tri cell if you're doing all three. But I can very quickly show you how to enter the data and how easy it is, and it would, it'll, it'll, it'll paint the picture for you. And then a question after that, is a standard curve required when running samples? Yes, the system will actually not let you start a sample unless you have a curve. All right. So, get that out of there. To build out a calibration, I would start with a whole new table, right? I'd start a new data set, make it nice and clean, name it for the day. But let's say on this one, I'm going to calibrate at one nanogram. I come over here and I change my state to calibration. And that's going to unlock my total nanograms here. Let me turn that to ppm because that's how I would do it. It's all based on weight. To calibrate the system, you actually only need to make four stock solutions to create uh, 20 plus curves, 20 plus points on your curve. So four stock solutions, and then you do different weights of those stock solutions to load different amounts of mercury on the system. So in one nanogram, I'd take 100 milligrams of 0 0.001 ppm solution. And I got my dilutions wrong, 0 0.01. And that gives me a calibration point of one nanogram. So that's not to say you have to weigh exactly 100, nan 100 milligrams. Your concentration of your stock solution does not have to be exactly 0.01 nanograms. But I am telling the system that this weight has this concentration. So it's assigning that nanogram point on the calibration curve. If my concentration was a little off and I made it heavy, it would just change that to 1.1, which is perfectly fine, right? You don't have to calibrate the system at exactly one nanogram. You can do it at, I, I don't, mine are not exact. My weights are a little off, my standard, as long as you, your concentration obviously has to be correct. 
but let's say my concentration entered correctly, I should say. Let's say my concentration is 0.011 and I you know, weighed 120 milligrams. All it's gonna do is change that calibration point to 1.32, perfectly fine. So you load up your sample table and we have a uh, making mercury standards document that I can send you that goes over all of this and uh, lays out recommended calibration points to kind of give you a better idea of how to, um, how to go about it for your specific application. Um, you do have to, do, it's gonna feel like you're running one long calibration curve. The system will automatically segment it into the cells. Uh, if you have a dual cell, you'll have two curves. If you have a, a tri-cell, you'll have three curves like my system here. And that's, uh, as you run it, it'll go through and it'll automatically populate your data points here. Let's say you accidentally injected a, uh, you put the wrong number on an auto sampler and you didn't inject a boat, right? So you got, you, were, you thought you were gonna weigh out five nanograms or, or, or have a point for five nanograms, but it's actually zero nanograms because you didn't have any sample, there was no boat. That point would be erroneous and it'd be off, but all you'd have to do is go in and check that point off and it removes it from the calibration curve. So it's really intuitive, very easy to do a calibration. Once you get it down on a tri-cell, you'll take about two hours on a dual cell, probably an hour and 15. Um, it's pretty rapid and it's passive work for the most part. Once you load the boats on with your, with your sample or with your calibration standards, you can walk away and it'll populate it all itself. Let's see. Are you able to download the method for the DMA? Yeah, um, for the methylmercury was the question. That method is going to be available shortly. I will get it sent out to everybody on this list once I finish rewriting it. My Italian colleague did write the method out. There's some um, English editing that I need to do on it, but it is a, a very robust and easy to follow method. And um, I say English editing, but their, their English is far better than my Italian. So they did a much better job than I could. Does the standard curve need to be matrix matched? No, we recommend you calibrate on liquid standards like you would an ICPMS. So I have, um, I have my 1000 PPM mercury standard here. It's from absolute standards, but you can get it from any, any qualified vendor. Um, you make your stock solutions from that, and then you build the calibration curve that way. I will say that, you know, especially to get to the low level concentrations on something like a tri-cell, you would need to use liquid standards because CRMs just don't get that low. The weights are too variable. But we do have clients and it's more specific to mining and cement, but they, and coal, but they will actually, um, they'll calibrate there because they're, they're on such high levels that, that it's, I don't wanna say it's not important, right? But we're not worried about 0 0.1 nanograms. We're worried about 100 nanograms. So it's not as severe for them they will actually calibrate the system on like a NIST certified reference coal material. And what they'll do is they'll just weigh out different amounts of that coal sample to build that calibration curve. Works perfectly fine for them because they already have it. Um, Lindsay, does that answer your question? I wanna make sure I, I understood it right. It would help if I scrolled down my window, cool. <laughs> Uh, let's see if we got any more. Um, can the system analyze combustible materials like flammable products? It sure can. It would be uh, kind of counterintuitive to think of it, right? Because we're, we're taking our sample in a quartz boat and we're heating it up to 650 degrees Celsius pretty rapidly. But we have app notes for crude oil, gasoline, naphtha, ethanol, acetone, really a lot of volatile things. And the way that you would run that is there is an extra step to it. You uh, add to the boat prior to weighing the sample what we call additive A. We call it additive A, it's silicone dioxide powder. It's very porous. So you weigh out about 300 milligrams of powder. You always run it through the DMA first, just the powder to make sure it's free of contamination, kind of blanks out the boat as well. So you have a nice clean, dry silicone dioxide powder. And then you take your, let's say gasoline and you weigh it over that powder. Um, you are limited on sample size, right? You can't put a gram of gasoline in here. It's just too much, it would overload the system. But for gasoline, let's say you're doing 50 milligrams. So you'd have your silicone dioxide powder, you'd weigh out your 50 milligrams over it. It's extremely porous, the silicone dioxide powder is, so it actually absorbs some of that, all of the gasoline into those pores, which quells the reaction. They release much more slowly from the pores of the silicone dioxide, which uh, stops it from being an exothermic reaction. So you won't get any pops or, or uh, violent combustion inside the system. So yeah, we have, uh, we have plenty of guys who are using it for analyzing hydrocarbons, um, naphtha, crude oil, a uh, ton of different different things that you can you can run in the system. There's really nothing you can't run on the system. Um, ah, cool. My sample. This is another good one. My sample contains acetic acid and uh, sodium hydroxide. Can I measure mercury on this sample in the DMA? You can. 
Um, if it's acidic or, or alkaline, I'm not sure what this one would be. Um, if it's acidic or alkaline, what you would do is you'd weigh out your sample. Um, about 100 milligrams is what we recommend to start with, maybe even a little less, right, 50. Um, so let's say you weigh out 50 milligrams of your sample. And what you're going to do is take that sample off the boat. You put your sample weight into the table here. After you've taken it off the boat, we're measuring total mercury on the sample, right? So every bit of mercury that's in that sample is going to get volatized off. What you want to do is reduce the overall acidity or alkalinity of that sample before you enter it into the DMA. So we've got our sample weight, and that's what it's going to calculate your concentration off of, right? Oops, I don't want to save that. So like on this one, I weighed out 152 milligrams of sample. I measured a uh, peak height of 0.67, which correlates to 18.25 total nanograms of mercury based on my calibration curve. And the 18.25 nanograms of mercury against this weight gives me a concentration of 120 ppb. And actually, while I have it up, I'll show you guys what the spectrograph looks like. So there's that sample right there. So there's my cell one, cell two, and it wasn't really high enough. It popped a little bit in cell three, but not a whole lot. So it took this peak automatically and integrated that into my calibration table. So it's measuring total mercury. You've got your total mercury in that 50, let's say 50 milligrams of your acetic acid sodium hydroxide solution. It's gonna measure the mercury there, dilute it with a little bit of DI water, 300 microliters, give or take. Kind of reduces the acidity, as long as the water's clean, right? You gotta make sure that you have a, a clean source of, of DI water that's not mercury contaminated, which hopefully you all do. You dilute that sample out. Um, the weight's not relevant of the water you put in because we've already assigned the actual sample weight to the table. Place the boat in there, press go, and it's all good. It'll all work. I will say that if you're doing, um, depending on the pH of that solution, if you're doing high acidic samples or high alkaline samples, you will degrade your catalyst and your amalgamator slightly faster. But we have plenty of clients who are running um, straight sulfuric acid on the system. They do the dilution step, but that is what they are running on the DMA. They're testing their sulfuric acid. See if I got any more. How does the system analyze gas samples? It analyzes them exactly the same way as it would a boat. Let's see if I have one here. Ah, got one. So how it analyzes that is, I'm gonna get close to the camera, this small adzo quick sorbent trap here, wrapped in quartz. And there's little quartz fritz on the side to keep the, uh, the sorbent from coming out. This little sorbent trap gets wired into either a mass flow controller or a pocket pump. You need to know how much volume of gas you're pushing over the sorbent trap. And then you measure it against that, right? That you enter the volume of gas in meters cubed that you've put on the sorbent trap. But what's neat about these is that you don't have to actually change anything. The quartz, sorry, the quartz, uh, the quartz around the sorbent trap works as your sample boat. So once you have your mercury trapped on the sorbent here, you just place it right on the auto sampler and run it like you would a regular sample. The fork will pick it up, it'll hold it perfectly fine, puts it into the catalyst, and you're good to go. Thank you for all the good questions, guys. I appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more. I'm going to work on getting that method rewritten for y'all, and I'll get it sent out to the uh, everybody who attended the the seminar probably in the next early next week, so you guys uh, can review it. It's a really simple method. It's easy to run. Um, just takes a little bit of time. If you have a manual shaker, it's much easier than doing it by hand. I had to do it by hand here, but um, it'll it'll work to just set it and forget it. With that, guys, if you need anything else, you can reach out to us at applications at milestonesci.com. Again, my name is Stephen Markle, Products and Applications Manager here for North America. Uh, thank you again for the time and look forward to speaking with you all. Have a good day.